for that. And let me get started. Uh, good afternoon. Welcome. Uh, I'm Kelvin Thompson here from UCS Center for Distributed Learning. And I'd like to welcome you to Effective Online Assessment, Scalable Success Strategies, part of UCF's brand new faculty seminars on online teaching. And in the interest of time, I am reading from a script. Uh, our intention in each of these 30-minute seminars is to provide a brief treatment of a topic relevant to online teaching while connecting our participants to an array of resources for more detailed follow-up. Today's seminar will be successful in our view if you walk away with at least one new idea you can put into action in your online teaching. And uh, we have 25 folks who are planning to participate on-site here in our Center for Distributed Learning offices, as well as about another 90 or so who are registered for online. Uh, so I imagine we'll still see a few more people drift in and a few more people come in online as well. Our online participants are in good hands with Kitsi Aviles as online moderator and Scott Rapp ensuring technical quality. Those of you who are here physically have found a few items in your, in your seats at your tables. Kitsi will address the online analogs for each of these items, but I'd like to draw your attention in particular to the index cards. Throughout the session, we invite you to write down on the cards provided first at least one tip or strategy or practice or idea that you found helpful in conducting assessments online on one card, and second, at least one question, issue, or concern you have about conducting assessments online on a separate card. And we have additional cards and additional handouts over here. And if you raise your hand, I'll get some to you in just a second. When you're done, just leave the cards where you are, where they are, and we'll pick them up at the end of the session. And Kitsi will provide direction for our online participants. We'll compile both groups of items and share the compilations with you after the seminar via email. And we'll provide, uh, while we will provide Q&A time today with our presenters, collecting these submissions will allow us to ensure that we address everyone's issues and share some good ideas in our focused time frame. That being said, no further ado, please join me in welcoming today's speakers, Dr. Tony Slow and Dr. Bobby Hoffman. Thank you. Let me just get this. PowerPoint pulled up real quick. Okay, here we go. Hopefully I can get out of that. Nope, I can't get out of that. Let me try to get, get rid of that little thing. Sometimes the mouse works, sometimes it doesn't. There we go. Okay. Now let's try it. Okay. All right, well, welcome everybody. As Kelvin said, boy, I feel like I'm on a racetrack because he just really ran through that really fast. But we do have a very short amount of time, and the idea behind the faculty seminars and online teaching, as Kelvin said, is to give you more or less a snapshot of a broader uh, topic. And today's topic, of course, is effective assessment. Obviously, from the amount of people that have signed up here face-to-face -face as well as online, we can see that there's a lot of interest in this topic. As faculty, we want to make sure that we are assessing our students authentically, and we want to try to, as much as possible, diminish opportunities for them to collaboratively take assessments. So um, that's going to be our focus today, um, is to provide you a snapshot. Assessment, effective assessment, covers a lot of areas. It can be activities, assignments, quizzes, exams. For today's session, we are going to narrow it in, basically talking about quizzes and exams and test item construction, which Bob is going to uh, give you a lot of information. Um, I'm going to return to this at the end of the uh, seminar, but we have lots of handouts available for you, other resources available online, and I will be giving you the URL as well. Um, so again, what you're going to get in here um, today is just a piece of it, sort of the tip of the iceberg. And then when you go online, you'll see a lot of other resources that will be available to you. We're going to very briefly explore the assessments tool option in web courses at UCF. Most of you who have been teaching either web or um, mixed courses or even the uh, web enhanced courses already are familiar with this tool, but it's just a sort of a refresher. Some of you may not have taught this, and so you may not um, understand the features of the tool. So we're just going to briefly touch on that. And then we're also going to provide examples of application-based assessment content. How do we go from just recall of information to application synthesis evaluation of information. How do, we, how do we assess for that? So that's going to be our focus for today. Dr. Chuck Zubin from uh, Wright, part of our, one of our teams here at CDL, and that's the um, research, help me Kelvin, research, research initiative for teaching, thank you, 
Um, he says this quote often when he speaks to um, our IDL 6543 participants. Do we expect technology to compensate for a lack of ethics? Because a lot of times when we start talking about effective assessment or we hear about cheating scandals or we hear about how challenging it is to get students to um, take quizzes and exams and things like that on their own, um, a lot of times it's related to online courses. We hear a lot about it for online courses. But the fact of the matter is, is that cheating can occur in all educational modalities. It can and it does, okay, whether it's face-to-face -face or online. Nobody is saying there aren't challenges to online assessment. There are. But it can occur in all modalities. So there is no magical way to prevent cheating. What we're going to try to show you today is some ideas, tips, strategies. Hopefully you guys have some ideas and suggestions to share as well that other people have used that help to diminish those opportunities, okay? There is no such thing as a closed book assessment in online courses. Um, you can't control what the students are going to access, okay? There are ways that you can diminish <coughs> their ability to access materials, textbooks, things like that, but you can't control in a geographically distant location whether they're Googling something that they just ran across on your exam or your test. So that's sort of a, a mind shift, a perspective that we need to make sure that we have. Um, authentic assessment can be activities, assignments, quizzes, or exams. Again, today we're focusing on quizzes and exams and test item construction. So our focus as faculty must be on student learning, not on student control, because we cannot control what they are going to do. We can simply set up the parameters and try our best to use technology to try to limit those opportunities for less than honest behavior, but we can't control it. So we need to focus on learning. Now briefly, um, and if you've not had any contact or any use with web courses at UCF assess assessments tools, there um, will be handouts, again, online that will kind of lead you through some of these things. So I'm just going to touch on some of this, but we're not going to go into any detail. You can also find more information on the Teaching Online site at teach.ucf.edu. But one of the ways that you can help to diminish um, cheating opportunities is, of course, through randomization. So you can have different tests that you offer at different semesters or even that you offer in the same semester. You can even provide different tests to different groupings of students if you want to. That is all done through selective release criteria using member criteria, which is built into the web courses tool. Okay? You can use randomization of assessment questions within the same test so that even if students are sitting side by side at a computer, they're not necessarily getting the same question at the same time. Um, you can use one of the most effective ways is to use question sets so that you can identify the categories and levels of difficulties from which web courses will pull. So it's like a question pool. That takes some time, but if you work on it over time and you continue to add questions to that pool, you can determine, you can have a variety of different um, assessments and, and exams and quizzes because it's pulling from all of these different kinds of questions. So theoretically, students are not going to get the same test when they're sitting side by side. Um, time limits. Do you give a time limit for a test? Do you give them 30 minutes? Do you give them an hour? Do you give them 10 minutes to answer one essay question? You know, what do you do or do you leave it totally open and unrestricted? That's a very good way to limit their ability to, you know, peruse all of the materials and just spend time going over things and looking for answers. How long do you leave the assessment open? Do you leave it open all week long? Do you leave it open only for, say, two hours on certain days of the week? You know, do you say group A students have to take it on this day at this time, group B students take it over here? Remembering, of course, with web that you always want to try to give alternatives, okay, because you don't know their schedules and they are taking courses for convenience. Do you display the questions one at a time or all at once? Either way, with this one, anybody can do a print screen and still print what they see on their, on their thing. But if you display it all at once, it's much faster for them to get that snapshot of your exam than if you're displaying it one at a time. Okay, so again, these are just tips that you can use that technology will help you. What about when you launch it? Does it have to be completed the first time? Or do they log in, take part of the test, save it, go out, and then come back later and take the rest? Well, if they go back out, Maybe they're comparing answers with students. Maybe they're looking into materials for more answers. Again, these are all faculty choices for how to use the tool to try to minimize that. Um, proctoring is, of course, a good way to provide assessments and quizzes. 
But in web-based classes, you need to be aware of the geographical constraints, okay? Um, you have to make sure that there's a facility that they can go to to be proctored. So you want to make sure that if you're giving a test early, for example, or maybe late, you might want to consider using an alternative test so that the student cannot compare. If you've got a student in a different time zone, for example, and they're getting it early before the rest of the class, well, then you, you might want to use an alternative so that they can't compare you know, and go onto a website. I believe a question from a participant was something about what if you know, they go on Facebook or something and share their experience. So you, don't, you want to prevent that if at all possible. So using alternatives is, is a good way to um, help prevent that. Now Bob is going to talk more about design strategies and specific test item construction. Thank you, Denise. <laughs> Denise's approach was largely from a technological perspective. I'd like to talk to you a bit more about from a cognitive or thinking perspective as to how to control the temptation for less than ethical responses to your variety of test questions. And I would like to focus on the word control because, as Denise said, the elimination is not feasible because there is the answer comparison that she talked about. But we want to remember one really, really important thing. The most, one of the most well-established principles of educational research is that knowledge is socially constructed. So the collaboration that we're all very fearful of isn't necessarily a bad thing, and I'll get back to that in a minute. What we do want to do when we say, and I get my student uh, perceptions of instruction, they say, oh, we hate Dr. Hoffman, he makes us think. Well, <laughs> even though that's potentially a negative perception from my point of view, there's nothing that I'd rather hear from, from my students that besides you making me think. So if we can emphasize critical thinking in the assessment process, we are likely accomplishing our learning objectives, and concurrently, we're likely reducing the temptation to cheat and compare answers. So simply, without going through all of the levels of Bloom's taxonomy, if you're asking definitional questions, that's a, a 30 second Google response. If you're asking comprehension, comprehension questions, which are a little bit more uh, challenging to the student, they can look those up as well. But if you create different situations where they actually have to apply and transfer the knowledge in your curriculum to another situation, which is the way we evaluate educational outcomes, merely recalling or recognizing things, if you submit a study to a journal with recall and recognition measures, you'll get your article rejected because there's no transfer of learning. So how do we get that transfer? You get that transfer by creating various different situations where students have to think. So what are those kinds of situations? There's a, a lot of different techniques that we can use, and we'll kind of talk about that. You may say, OK, I, and here's a big dilemma, and I even though, by comparison to some of the people in the room, my online classes sizes are small. I only have about 125, but I understand that somebody in this room that has 1,400 people in an online class, so I'm, yeah, I think I should defer to you guys. But, <laughs> but the real challenge is how do you balance the quality of the learning outcomes with your ability to assess those from a real practical point of view, such as time. So for the most of us, what we have to do is we can't create these fantastic learning and transfer situations because it's not practical when you have 1,400 people in your class to have great essay tests, for example. So how do we do it? Well, you can even do it with a true and false question. If you look at this question, can you look this up in a matter of seconds? Of course you can. Now, what were the causes of the Civil War? How about this one? Could you Google this answer? Probably not. This answer requires you to know, of course, what you can look up the definition of abolitionism, but you wouldn't necessarily be able to create the connection between the application of the concept to a practical use of the concept. So, of course, the answer to this question would be. Come on, guys. <laughs> okay. It's a true false question. <laughs> true false question. Is it true or false? Okay, but you couldn't look it up. Now, most uh, how many of you actually use true and false questions? So we we can get to 
higher levels of thinking, even with the true-false question beyond definition. Multiple choice question. It's one that I, I've used over and over in my uh, learning theory and assessment class. You have to know different forms of terminology. This is a fairly decent question. You can't just look this up. You can see a number of answers, but you at least have to know conceptually what these various constructs are, such as true experimental research, uh, generalizability, and validity. So it makes it a little bit more complex. This still, I would not say, would be the ideal type of question you want to use in an online assessment. What you can do is create these scenarios, and this is what I usually do all of the time. This process is not any more time consuming than writing a multiple choice question that measures comprehension or, or, or definitions, but it, uh, it requires, number one, they can't look this up. You may have in your modules offered a variety of different scenarios for them to analyze and then can base the test questions on those scenarios, or you can create in a few sentences a particular situation and ask students, well, what would happen in this situation? What would I do? Now, if, you, if you're familiar with the, with the terminology of scaffolding, you know that scaffolding is support in the educational process through a variety of means, and you can, they have to actually critically analyze each one of these statements to determine what is or is not scaffolding. And the one that is not scaffolding would be choice D. Now, there's a lot of a variety of different techniques. Unfortunately, we don't have the time today to get into all of the various types, but I'll give you some suggestions. Here's the best answer format. All of these answers are correct. Every single one. So if you look them up, they'll probably come across these. But you can ask them to justify why is the answer correct. This particular process is a little bit more labor intensive because you may have to do go beyond um, web courses based scoring procedures. You might actually have to physically look at the score. But, but this is a, another approach. Uh, you guys, uh, some of you are uh, more or less seasoned than I am, but you guys remember Carter? <laughs> Carter? Okay. You don't have to ask them the answer. Ask them the question. Give them the answer. If you give them the answer, they can't look it up. Give them a series of questions to say, based upon this answer, what is the appropriate question associated with that answer? Different strategy. One that I really like is give them the wrong answer. Give them the question, give them the answer, then have your multiple choices. Why is the answer that I provided to you incorrect? Those are your response alternatives. The answer provided to the question is incorrect because they give four different choices. So they have to think about it. Now, of course, this is not foolproof. It can't be foolproof because, like Denise said, people in different time zones, people uh, like to share information. But I take the approach, and this is a little antithetical to logic and reason, but I sometimes encourage them to work together. The social construction of knowledge is one of the main fundamental principles of how we learn. Now, that doesn't mean you'll sit in a group and answer a definitional uh, multiple choice type question, but if you provide a complex scenario and you require them to exchange information and to solve that problem, you have accomplished your goal as an instructor, which is to promote learning outcomes and to promote transfer. I'm a little bit unorthodox in that way, because some of you say, well, that doesn't show independence of thought. But what it does show is collaboration. It shows problem solving. It shows use of resources. And it shows transferable skills, provided you create the right types of questions that really involve thinking and problem solving. Uh, some of the other things that we can do, do a chart and grab it. And figure it out actually use some of the fundamental skills that they've brought to the table. Another very prevalent and well-established research principle is people build off their background knowledge. 
So if they have certain background knowledge, then they need to take that knowledge, incorporate what you taught them, and take the next step. Chart and graph is a great way to accomplish that. And by the way, we've been found through a variety of assessment uh, feedback that students have a tough time with charts and graphs. That's a skill that they need to build and one that they'll use uh, authentically in their lives. A lot of the other things you can do, have students design questions. I love, I do that with my students, and of course I have this uh, course in assessment, but I ask them for their final exam, the class creates the questions that will be on the exam. Talked about why is the answer correct? This, this is really a great one. Peer evaluation, create a rubric, ask them to do an assignment, compare their assignment to the rubric. It helps them calibrate what good work is. And especially if you're in the College of Education, pre-service teachers, calibration with existing standards is a really important database skill. And finally, for the sciences and math, you give them particular experiments to deconstruct, to analyze why things are happening. All these techniques, in, in summary, really help them emphasize the thinking and transfer process, and that's what it's really all about. Great. Thank you, Bob. Anybody got any burning questions right off the top of their head right now? And if maybe both of you guys can come a, come a little bit closer to the mic. Some people online are having a little bit of difficulty hearing, hearing so this might help a, a little bit. Okay. okay. Um, we are going to, as Kelvin said, we are going to take up anything that you've got like on the uh, um, on your index cards to try to address at a later point, and they'll be put online. But if anybody has something that's just right on the top of their head that maybe Bob or I could help address, we'd be glad to. Um, if not, we have something else that we can show you, but I wanted to give you that opportunity first. Anybody? Could you clarify the peer evaluation of reflections and essays? Yeah, what I have them do in would my course, they... Would you receive the question also? For oh, okay. The question is, can I clarify what I mean by peer evaluation of reflections and essays? In, in my course, and this relates to field experience, uh, learners need to go out into the field and do observations in a classroom. And they record their observations and then write about it from the perspective of the content in the course. So what I have them do is evaluate each other's work by comparing their narrative of their observational visit to a rubric and to a, I give them a number of different examples to start out the process. I give them a really bad example, a mediocre example. of the, It's called the journal entry and a very good example and it helps them gain the assessment skill, but it also helps me in the grading process because students are making recommendations on the quality of other students' work. And you can do this anonymously within web courses. And I also use another system called Expertiza through a uh, professor at the University of North Carolina. So we're testing that out now. But, but the essential skill that is gained is calibration of their work to good work or their work to poor work, and it helps them develop their own skills. Gain is calibration of their work to good work or their work to poor work, and it helps them develop their own skills.
constantly balanced. Saying that. If you think about all the stuff that that, that I talk talked about Much of it Do some up. Front work. But once you to create. those scenario or situation
you can roll. Rotate. The interpret. Question. 